I'm Shep Hyken, and here's what's coming up on this edition of Be Amazing or Go Home. Being amazing in tough times, asking the right questions of your customers and employees can help you thrive through tough times. We'll break down the seven questions that will help drive more success. Memorable messages. Creating powerful presentations can be challenging, especially in our ever-growing virtual world. Patricia Fripp will be here in the studio and is the absolute expert when your message must be memorable. Courageous cultures. Silence isn't always golden. Effective organizations need people to speak up. And Karen Hurt joins us with the ultimate guide to building a workplace environment that values outspokenness. Hasta la vista, baby. We've talked about why customers terminate relationships with companies, but when is it time for you to fire your customers? The amazing quote will show us. So, are you ready to be amazing? We'll stay tuned for all of this and more coming up next on Be Amazing or Go Home. Hello, I'm Chef Hyken, and this is Be Amazing or Go Home, the show dedicated to take you from average to amazing. The economic fallout from the pandemic has created tough times for many industries. Now, during these times, some companies and brands flourished while others struggled. Some brands seem to have business models that were right for the times, and others were not so lucky. Some went out of business. Some barely hung on. Then there's some you would have thought were going to fail, yet somehow they came out ahead. So what did these organizations do differently? Well, Paul Riley, the author of Selling Through Tough Times, who we've had on this show earlier this season, has a theory that success comes in asking the right questions. The key is to understand your customers, what they want, what they need, and what they're thinking, especially during tough times. And don't just ask customers, ask employees as well. The people on the front line, and that includes sale uh, people, customer support people, they have direct interaction with customers and can bring their experiences and their feedback they're hearing from customers back to leadership. So with that in mind, here are seven important questions that will help you achieve more success during tough and uncertain times. Number one, what's missing? Find out if there's something more that the customer needs that you could provide. Maybe you already offer it, but the customer doesn't know it. It doesn't have to be about what you sell. It can be about the, the process the customers experience. Find out what's missing that could make the customer experience better. Number two, on a scale of one to 10, how is our support during these tough times? What can we do better? This is a two-part question. Business as usual is a history lesson during tough times. Customers have different needs and concerns. Some will even exhibit different emotions. They'll answer this question differently in tough times versus historically normal times. Number three, how can we further customize our solution for you? Customers like a personalized experience. Our customer experience research shows that 75% of customers in the U.S. are more likely to be loyal to a company or a brand that delivers a personalized customer experience. If you want to know what customers want in a personalized or customized solution, just ask them. Number four, why would a customer choose to do business with a competitor over us? This is a question for the entire team. If we can find a weakness or a flaw in what we sell, it's only a matter of time before a competitor spots it and uses it against us. And if a competitor is noticing a weakness, it's likely the customer is noticing as well. Number five, if we started from scratch, what would the ideal solution look like? This question is also for the team. All you have to do is take a look at how businesses have adapted during the last 18 months, and you'll see how some companies have actually redefined themselves. You may not need to create a completely different business model, but you can use a what if question to kickstart a creative and innovative conversation. Number six, what additional problems or challenges are our customers currently facing that they weren't facing before? 
It doesn't take a pandemic to create new challenges for customers. Challenges can come from competition, changes in the economy, or just changes in the times. This question can create some great conversation with both team members and colleagues. And number seven, how can we make it easier to do business with our company? This is a powerful question for both the company and the customer. Customer experience is at the forefront of business strategy, specifically the experience that is proving to be a tiebreaker in business is about being easy and convenient. All things being equal, the company that is easiest to do business with wins. These questions will help drive more success for both you and your customers. Customers want the companies they do business with to be solid as a rock. They want certainty and stability. Doing this right creates consumer confidence, which can drive repeat business and loyalty. So spend time discussing these questions and more to help thrive, not just survive in tough and uncertain times. Memorable messages are now more important than ever, especially in today's virtual world. So what techniques can lead you to the results that you want? Patricia Fripp is one of the world's foremost speech coaches, working with executives from the Fortune 100 and the top professional speakers on how to make more powerful presentations. And Patricia joins us now in the studio to talk about how to get amazing results from your next presentation. Welcome to Be Amazing or Go Home. I'm always <laughs> amazing when I'm with you. Well, thank you. So I've got a a number of questions here and I just want to first of all say that yes you are the speech coach to the stars both in the corporate world as well as the professional speaking world uh, Hall of Fame speakers speakers that have won awards have come to you to get their coaching so we truly including myself by the way I'm a proud client I hope I've done you good service and, and all of this but what and, and I guess let's start with this why are good presentation skills so important to business Leaders need to inspire action and commitment in their associates, their partners, their customers, and shareholders. And that means they need to use powerful, reassuring words. I grew up listening to stories from my parents tell me how Winston Churchill would get on the radio and with the power of his words, people would fight in the street and feel inspired in the worst of times. He didn't have a PowerPoint. He <laughs> used his words. Yes. And powerful words from well-intentioned leaders can change the whole feel of a company. So if you had a secret to share with somebody giving a presentation, any type of a speech, maybe it's an executive, what would that be? Focus on who is the audience. For example, if an executive said, our new strategy will help the shareholder value, that's great if you're talking to the board of directors or shareholders. Unless your associates are shareholders, that isn't the right message. You need to adapt the message in that case to say, with our new strategy, we'll increase sales. That means more job security. Same message to different audiences have to focus on who is the audience and why would they care? So the key is to know the audience, and I think perhaps the best way to go about that is to ask, do the research. What, 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 how do you go about that? It's not that complicated. If you are speaking at a conference and there are different disciplines and industries, at least some of your talking points has to allude to the different industries. If it is an executive, then with my executive clients, I always make sure who are some of the unsung everyday heroes that you are going to include in your presentation. So connect with the audience, include people from the audience yes. in your presentation. That's going to draw everybody a little bit closer together. But I think the key is to, to ask, I know when I get ready to do a presentation, I send out a pre-programmed questionnaire and I to ask, who is in the audience? What are their positions? I ask, what are their biggest concerns? I, I want to know, is there anything I need to stay away from? I don't want to make that mistake, because that could blow everything. All right, let's talk about stories, something you're very famous for, telling stories, creating stories, helping speakers write their stories. Is there any tips you can share with us about how to be a better storyteller in business? Yes. With executives, 
I'm always trying to find the moments in their earlier lives that can tie to their messages. For example, with one executive, he was talking about the importance of strategy. And I said, Bernard, when did you realize the importance of strategy? And he said, I was a 14-year-old ball boy before the French Open. And people came in to see the, like, the match. To the tennis French Open. Yes. Uh, yeah. And they didn't realize that they were going to have to watch a match of the ball boys first. And he said, I was, I was playing against my best friend. We were equally matched in talent and experience. However, their ball boy was his friend's sister who wanted her brother to win, so he, she was trying to sabotage the way she threw the balls. <laughs> now, that's and, good strategy. Yeah, yes. No, no. <laughs> and Bernard said, I was playing against equally matched talent and I was at a disadvantage. That is when I realized the importance of strategy. And all executives say, and I know they say to you, do people really want to hear these simple stories? Yes, because we will fight in the street for the person. You respect the position. Right. So these personal stories, but stories are about people, and we like to hear what the characters say. So you deliver the dialogue rather than report on the dialogue. So, for example, a sales, the sales manager can say, I was talking to Shep, and he said, John, I couldn't be more pleased with your customer service because, rather than I was talking to Shep and he was happy with our service. Deliver the dialogue. Yeah, tell the story, use the dialogue. So um, I know we're running out of time, but I just want to know, are there some major mistakes that people make when they're giving presentations? The major mistakes that I see mostly are one, waiting to the last minute, two, focusing too much on slides rather than what is the message I want to get across and what is the best way to say it, and then thinking once they've got the slides and the outline, they're done. No, they're halfway done. As Michael Caine said, rehearsal is the work, performance is the relaxation. Oh, wow. So when you've got your presentation, now you have to get it in your body so your words fall flawlessly from your lips. Uh, well, you coached me on a presentation. I had five points I wanted to make. And you said you need to learn those five points so well that you could do them forwards, backwards, mix them up in any order. And when you can do that, then you can go on stage and do it comfortably. You are known for a famous phrase. What is that phrase? Share with our viewers. Specificity builds credibility. And the number one question I ask all my clients is, if it weren't a thing, what would it be? And I often hear innovative upgrades, new strategy. It's never a thing. Yeah, and, and even numbers, it's like a bunch of. Well, give me the exact numbers. Yes, a bunch is for fruits and vegetables. <laughs> All right, my final question. One last nugget you want to share with this audience, what would it be? Nothing will position you ahead of the crowd as much as being a powerful, persuasive presenter. Wow. All right. Patricia Fripp, the famous one. And if, I just want to say that you are wonderful to work with one-on-one, -on -one, but you also have an amazing online program. And I'm just going to throw this out there. You weren't expecting me to do it, but anybody that is interested in learning about how to be a better speaker, go to Fripp On Demand. Yes? Fripp VT. Oh, Fripp as VT is in virtual training. Virtual training. Fripp virtual training. FrippVT.com. Learn about Patricia there. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom on our show today. My pleasure. Time now for the amazing app brought to you by Outreach Studios. And this app possesses many of the principles of the convenience revolution. Grammarly simplifies great writing by composing bold, clear, mistake-free writing with an AI, that's artificial intelligence, powered writing assistant. So Grammarly reduces friction for its users by making the writing process simple and improving communication. 
The technology principle comes into play with the AI-powered writing assistant as Grammarly suggests changes that will help your readers better understand the message. Grammarly also works where you do, as you can get suggestions and corrections while you write on Gmail, Twitter, LinkedIn, and many other sites and solutions. Grammarly also offers a subscription service that goes beyond grammar and spelling with their Grammarly Premium Level, which can give you style, tone, and clarity improvements. And it will even check for things like plagiarism and fluency. Grammarly even has a business feature allowing you to engage customers with consistent communication, potentially giving you a competitive advantage by creating more time for high value work. Grammarly essentially turns your brand voice into a tone profile so your team can strike the right notes for every customer interaction. And the business function can also integrate seamlessly with your workflows across platforms, devices, and different departments within your team. So by reducing friction for its customers with the help of cutting edge technology, all while providing self-service, subscription, and accessible options, this is what truly makes Grammarly an amazing app. From executives complaining that their teams don't contribute ideas to employees, throwing up their hands because their input isn't valued, well, company culture might be the culprit. The book Courageous Culture provides a roadmap to build a high performance, high engagement culture around sharing ideas, solving problems, and rewarding contributions from all levels. And here to talk about all that and more is the author of Courageous Cultures, Karen Hurt. Uh, Hello, Karen. Thank you so much for having me, Thanks. Chef. I love the book Courageous Cultures, and I, I just want to know, for our audience, I could tell you what it is because I've interviewed about this before. What is a courageous culture? Yeah, our favorite definition of culture comes from the marketing guru, Seth Godin, which is simply people like us do things like this. So in a courageous culture, what is it that people like us do? They speak up, they solve problems, they share best practices, and they bring forward ideas to improve the customer experience. I, I believe that that definition of culture may be the best I've ever heard. Give it to me one more time. People like us do things like this. Wow, and that's what we do. And uh, really, culture is uh, comes from like the Latin word, I think the word is cultus. Uh, and the word cult is part of that, and everybody thinks cult is a dirty word, but no, cult is culture, and it's a group of like-minded people doing things they love to do. People like us do things like this. I love that. So what inspired you to write the book, Courageous Culture? So it was so interesting. We were going in and we were working at the executive level of a variety of companies across a variety of industries around the world, and we were noticing a consistent pattern. Executives were consistently saying, gosh, why am I the only one to think of these new ideas? Why don't my managers bring forward some of these best practices? How come I have to go do a skip level meeting to discover some of the good things that are happening in my organization? And then we would go to do training at the frontline supervisor level of these very same organizations. And we would hear things like, nobody ever wants to hear my ideas. Nothing ever happens anyway. Why bother? We thought, oh, are you working for the same company? So we set out to do an extensive research study with the University of North Colorado to answer that question. When people were holding back ideas, what kind of ideas were they holding back? And they weren't trivial, like kombucha in the break room. They, kombucha, <laughs> in, you've got to tell, kombucha in the break room. Right, they were in- it, But what's kombucha? Kombucha is that fancy fermented tea. Right? Okay. But instead, they were bringing, they, the ideas they said they were not contributing were ideas to improve the customer experience, the employee experience, or productivity in a process. And so we set out to answer what was holding them back and then come up with very practical tools to make it easy for leaders at all levels to seek out the ideas of their employees. Right, so now you said you did some research and I'm very familiar with the folks out there in, in Colorado. Here are some stats and I think part of what you're talking about, 49% didn't share their ideas because nobody asked, which I thought, uh, you know, like we need to make it easier for people to share their ideas. 67% uh, don't think leaders want new ideas because we've always done it this way, why would we change, right? And 56% uh, withheld uh, because the fear they just wouldn't get credit where credit was due. And that one bothers me a lot, but let's talk about some of the research. Yeah, so, uh, and 40% said they lacked the confidence to share their ideas. Mm. So that's why you need a deliberate process. Going out and just saying, I have an open door is not enough. 
because for some people it still takes some level of courage to walk through an open door. And Dr. Amy Edmondson of Harvard, who did the, she's the pioneer of psychological safety, she wrote the foreword of the book, you know, she said, people are more likely to hold on to a negative experience than a positive experience which means that even if you are the most human-centered leader that ever walked on the planet, there's a possibility people are still holding on to a negative experience from the past that's keeping them shut down. That, not that they've had with the leader, right. but they've had in the past with anybody. Yes. And they were afraid, you know, what's going to happen. I, you know, they don't trust their instincts. It's like, just try it one time. Come in here with an idea. Just see what happens. Right. Yep. Right. So it needs to be managed well. And I also think what's important here is if a leader makes a joke about something where it might be funny to some people and it might be really weird and even scary to others, like, oh, I don't want them joking about me, that'll cause them to withdraw and uh, a loss of courage, if you will. Yes, that's a, what we call a toxic courage crusher mm -hmm. in Chapter 4. Okay, <laughs> and speaking of toxic courage crushers in Chapter 4, what other tools and ideas can you share with us from the book? Yeah, so we have a seven-step process for creating a courageous culture. We don't have time to go into all seven, but let's start with the first four because that can happen at every level of the okay. business. It starts with what we call navigating the narrative, and that's getting very clear about your own relationship with speaking up and sharing ideas because your team is watching and leaders go first. So that's the first part of it. Then it's creating clarity, and that's clarity about two things. One, clarity that you really do want people's ideas, and clarity about what a great idea would accomplish. And this is really important because we tested the tools in two ways. And one was just saying, bring us any ideas to improve the business. We got a much higher quality of ideas, more usable ideas, when we said, you know where we need ideas? We need ideas around this strategic initiative. We need ideas for our DE&I strategy. We need ideas to improve the customer experience. We need the ideas to help people feel more confident in working with customers while they're working from so home. So specificity, yes. which is an important word for the day here. <laughs> yes, uh, it all rhymes, right? It does. And then cultivating curiosity is the next step. Mm -hmm. And this is proactively going out and asking people for their ideas. Things like asking a courageous question, which is a question that is specific specific, yeah. and vulnerable. So something like uh, Don Yeager uh, of Mural Consulting, he, he says, what is one policy we have that just sucks? Right? He asks his frontline agents answering the phone that question. And he makes the policies. So he, right, he's the COO. So, but, but consistently asking that, he's been asking that question as long as I've known him. And he's getting, he gets people to talk and then he says, thank you, and now what else? And now he's open to conversation. And then the fourth step is responding with regard, because if you recall, 50% said nothing will ever happen, so that's why I don't speak up. A lot of the time, that's just because people, are, their loop isn't being closed about what's happening with those ideas. Uh, so you've got to actually give feedback. That was a great idea. Let me share with you how we used it, or yes. why didn't we use it, I think is also important. Exactly. All right, we have time for one more little nugget from you, and I'm okay. gonna ask the advice, because there are a lot of people here that aren't necessarily at the very top of the pyramid, top right. of the food chain, the CEO. What one piece of advice that you have for somebody that might be a little bit uncomfortable yeah. sharing their idea? The first thing I would say is, do you think your boss, if you came to them and said, you know what, I really care about this business, I really care about this organization, I care about our team, I want us to be successful, I have an idea. Do you think they'd be interested in hearing your I idea? I think at that point you've <laughs> said, uh, this is, I love you, please listen to me. Right, right. and <laughs> then the, the, what we teach in the training is to position your ideas using our idea model, which is, why is this idea, I, interesting, meaning why is it strategically aligned with where you said you need a great idea? Is it doable, D? Can we pull this off? So you explain to your boss, this idea is interesting. D, this is why it's doable, we can pull it off. E, engaging, here's who else might think it's a good idea. This is why our customers would buy in. This is why HR is likely to support it. This is why finance might think it's a good idea. And then A, actions. What are a couple of key recommended first steps? And so if you position your ideas that way, I guarantee you, you will at least be showing up as a critical thinker who cares passionately about the business, even if your idea isn't used this time. Wow. Well, the book, it is titled Courageous Cultures, and this is Karen Hurt, and thank you so much for being on our show. Oh, thank you so much, Chef. It's been a delight. Well, it's time to hear from you and time to ask Shep, which is brought to you 
by Outreach Studios. You can find me anywhere on the web, including these social channels. So use the hashtag AskShep to ask me your questions or share your amazing stories. So let's begin. Lindsay Weber is an office manager at a real estate company, and she asks, what do you think of chatbots as a customer service tool? So chatbots continue to improve. The technology has a better ability to understand questions asked many different ways. The ability to overcome the customer's mistakes in grammar and spelling and punctuation and to give an overall human-like experience. Digital has become a go-to first choice for many customers. Now that said, for it to be truly successful, even with the great improvements, there will be times when the customer will need to move from a conversation with a chatbot to one with a human or live agent. At that point, there must be a seamless transition that causes, ideally, no friction for the customer. The company or brand that gets this right will win in a world where customer service is more important than ever. Next, we have Sarah Jones, who owns a full solution technology company, and she says, I'm having a hard time keeping my employees. What can I do to hire good people and get them to stay? Well, this is a big question and a big problem for many businesses today. We could spend an entire show, maybe many shows, on this specific question. So let me share a couple of thoughts. First, consider the interview as part of the onboarding process, even though they haven't been hired yet. This is the opportunity to give the applicant an idea of your culture. Uh, through the interview, you'll see if they get excited and buy into that culture. Now second, make sure your wages and benefits are competitive and won't be the reason the applicant won't keep looking for a better opportunity after you hire them. If you're scared of paying more, just consider the cost of hiring and training a new employee. It's usually much less expensive to pay a little bit more. And third, create a job experience that gets people working for the company and not the paycheck. They should love the culture and who they work with. And finally, Elisa Percelli, she's a cosmetologist, and she says, I probably know what you're going to say about this. Every time I lower my price, my direct competitor lowers their price. Then my sales drop. Can you help me find a way to get my customers to come back? Yes, you probably do know what I'm about to tell you. If all you do is compete on price, the competitor that offers a lower price will win. So you've trained your customers to know you for your low prices. It's now time to train them to recognize you for the experience that you provide. If you aren't already focused on customer service and experience, it's time to do so. Make sure your employees are ready to play in this area. Get them properly trained. You want them to be friendly, knowledgeable, and responsive. Get customers to give you feedback. You can use a survey or you can ask them directly. And and when they tell you what's important to them, listen and act accordingly. Not all feedback is actionable, but when you get a suggestion that is, it's a gift. Do something with it. Your goal is to make your customers less sensitive to your low prices and more appreciative of the value and the experience that you provide. So are you ready to be amazing? Remember, you can find me just about anywhere on social media. So connect with us on our social channels and don't forget to use the hashtag AskShep to ask me your question or share your amazing story. Time now for the amazing quote brought to you by Outreach Studios. And again, it comes from Arnold Schwarzenegger, but this time from the movie Terminator 2. Hasta la vista baby. Hasta la vista, baby. Now sometimes you'll even need to say this to your customers. Now let's hope none of your customers are as bad as the T-1000 from Terminator 2. But yes, believe it or not, some customers are not worth doing business with. Now last episode, we talked about why a customer would terminate their business with you. In my latest just released book, I'll Be Back, how to get customers to come back again and again. I also recognize that there are reasons that you may not want to continue to do business with them, the customer. In other words, you and your company want to terminate the relationship with your customer. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, here are three reasons straight from the book. 
Number one, you aren't able to meet the customer's expectations and don't think you ever can. Even with the best intentions to take care of the customer, you just can't do it. Maybe you're doing your best, but you realize it's just not good enough for this customer. Their expectations may be too high and you may consider them unreasonable. So you choose to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Let me suggest some other people or other companies who might be able to better meet your needs. On a more positive note, as difficult as this customer might have been, their higher expectations may have challenged your organization to live up to a higher standard, and that could be good for all of your customers. Number two, the customer is unacceptably rude to a team member. A certain level of rudeness might be forgivable, but if the customer crosses the line with racial slurs, foul language, and name calling, it may be time to step in and let the customer know they've gone too far and it's time to move on. I'll add this is a leadership decision. A supervisor, manager, or company leader must step in to terminate the customer. And when managed the right way, it demonstrates a commitment to the employees and it shows them that you care more about them than the sale from an unreasonably rude customer. That's good for the morale of the team. And number three, the customer has not paid for the product or service that you provide. This is an easy one. How long will you let your customers keep taking your products and services without paying for them? Unless there's special circumstances, it's not a good business model to work for free. Find out why the customer isn't paying. And that said, there may be legitimate reasons for a customer not paying and showing some empathy and understanding for those reasons could go a long way in the future relationship with the customer. In most of these cases, terminating the relationship doesn't have to be a permanent hasta la vista baby. It doesn't have to be forever. You want to keep the door open. At some point, the customer may want to say, I'll be back. And for the right reasons, you may want them to do so. Well, that wraps up this edition of Be Amazing or Go Home. And remember, you can find me just about anywhere on social media. So be sure to connect with us on our social channels. And don't forget to use the hashtag AskShep to ask me your questions. Thanks for tuning in. This is Shep Hyken reminding you to always be amazing.